Remember, 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 remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. I know of no reason why gunpowder and treason should ever be forgot. In the year 1605, a dramatic plot was uncovered, and had it been successful, it would have changed the course of English and Scottish history forever. The conspiracy involving a group of Catholics and led by Robert Catesby is ingrained in the minds of English people each year, with nationwide celebrations in autumn commonly referred to as Guy Fawkes Night. This a nod to Guy Fawkes, the York man who was the first of the group to be discovered. For Guy, with 36 barrels of gunpowder, had been hiding under the Houses of Parliament in London. Had he succeeded in his mission, the explosion would have wiped out the entire royal family, the lords and the commons. But who was this man from York, and how did he get involved in such a grotesque act of treason and attempted murder? In today's video, we'll find out just that. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel The Wanderless Way. In today's episode, we're visiting the city of York in Yorkshire, England, where the notorious Guy Fawkes was born. We're going to walk the popular trail that leads us through the city streets and buildings which Guy would have encountered. Let's imagine what life really would have been like for a young boy growing up in a turbulent world, and how events that happened here in York would mould him and some of his fellow conspirators into treasonous activities that have gone down in history. So please sit back, relax and enjoy the video. If you do enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up so we know it's been good. Comment with your feedback if you will, and subscribe to the channel for similar content in the future. Enough waffle, let's wanderlust. As the lords and royals busily prepared themselves, and the rain battered down on the capital streets, you could imagine they would think this to be a day like any other state opening of Parliament in November. But history tells us that things are about to heat up in London. But underneath the drizzly scene, and unbeknown to the bustle above, waits a traitor to the kingdom. For hidden secretly below was the 35-year-old York Catholic, Guido Fawkes. The year is 1605, and what you are imagining is the midst of a dangerous plot about to be uncovered. This conspiracy by a group of provincial English Catholics was aimed to assassinate the Protestant King James I of England and VI of Scotland, and replace him with a Catholic head of state. In the meantime, though, an anonymous letter warns the monarchy and Parliament that they are in grave danger, and the events down here in the cellar are about to take a dramatic turn. Before the barrel could be lit, Guy Fawkes is caught red-handed, about to light a stash of gunpowder under the Houses of Parliament. Now that the plot was discovered, Fawkes and those conspirators who remained alive were tried for high treason in Westminster Hall. After being tortured on the rack, Guy was sentenced to hanging, drawing and quartering. King James I decrees that henceforth, November the 5th will be an annual day of celebration. Today people in England light bonfires and set fireworks into the sky in a tradition that started all those years ago and repeats itself annually to commemorate the failure of the gunpowder plot of 1605. Often an effigy of Guy Fawkes is made and burned on top of the bonfire. This burning of a guy has ensured the gunpowder plot endures in the national memory and reminds us all what can happen if we attempt to commit treason. The act of throwing a dummy on the fire to represent a person has been done since the 13th century to drive away evil spirits. But what led to these events of 1605? What experiences must a man have to make him bold enough to risk everything and commit treason against his king? On this walking trail we explored the events of the time and the city that Guy Fawkes and some of his fellow conspirators grew up in. But to get the backdrop of this story, we have to go even further back in time, starting in the 1530s when King Henry VIII is on the throne. Most English children are taught in school the ways of the notorious King Henry VIII. This large man with a dangerous lust for power and wives was to make some very brutal decisions that would continue to echo through time for years after his death. In an attempt to annul one of his marriages, Henry VIII severely breaks down relations with the Pope in Rome. 
In course, he boldly replaces himself as the head of the church instead. Anyone who remains loyal to the Pope is now an outlaw and a traitor. By the year 1536, Henry starts to close the monasteries, including one here in York that we'll visit later on in this video. In 1553, after the death of Henry, Queen Mary restores Catholicism and begins persecuting the Protestants, killing 400. This decision, alongst others, gives her the nickname Bloody Mary. But when she dies and leaves the crown to her half-sister Elizabeth, the old ways resume again. In 1558, we see Elizabeth I take up the persecution of the Catholics once again. She passes laws to weed out recusants, which are Catholics who refuse to convert to the Protestant faith. Guy Fawkes, therefore, is born into a world most turbulent. In the city he calls home, many Catholics die in the crowded prisons of York, and in total, 41 are executed. We begin our trail outside St Michael the Belfry in the city of York. It is situated at the junction of High Petergate and Minster Yard, directly opposite York Minster. As we stand in front with York Minster to the left and Guy's birthplace to the right, it seems the perfect place to begin our journey. Guido Fawkes was born a Protestant in York in 1570. His father died when he was nine and was buried in York Minster with Guy's grandparents. York Minster can be seen to the left of this shot. Guy's mother remarried into a family of recusants, the very Catholics in secret that Elizabeth I is set to weed out. The family she marries into has close ties to the Percy family of Northumbria, who are known rebels against the King of England. The Inglebys and the Pullens are also related. John Pullen was headmaster at Guy's school, which we will visit shortly. Guy and both of his sisters were baptised in St Michael the Belfry Church. I'm told you can see a document of Guy's baptismal entry just inside the west entrance to the church, but unfortunately it was closed on the day we visited. The present church building was built between 1525 and 1537. If you cross the road from the church, you can enter what is believed to be the birthplace of Guy Fawkes. Two buildings near the corner of Stonegate and Petergate both claim to be the original birthplace, but most people gravitate towards the Guy Fawkes Inn, which is now a pub, restaurant and hotel. At the time of Guy Fawkes' childhood, this building would have been a multitude of different tenements, and over the years it has been knocked about and pieced together, including once being a schoolhouse. Today it is a four-star inn that boasts views over the York Minster. It oozes atmosphere with its gaslit bar and dining room, but it also boasts the best pies in York. However, it is known on the dark scene for being a hot spot for paranormal activity. From here we walk deep into the shambles area. This most famous intertwining of streets is an attraction in itself that encourages visitors from all over the world each day. Today it looks almost exactly as it did in the time of Guy Fawkes. Since the medieval era this was the Butcher's Street and it is here we'll talk about a very important figure in this tale. Margaret Clitheroe was nicknamed the Pearl of York. She was a staunch Catholic who lost her life in the name of Catholicism. Margaret married a prosperous butcher who owned a shop here on the Shambles. Despite the dangers, Margaret succeeded in creating a concealed room in her home on the street, along with a secret hidden cupboard in which she allowed masses to be said. In 1586, Margaret was betrayed and charged of harbouring priests. What happens next is brutal, and her tragedy gripped the city and quite possibly the 16-year-old Guy Fawkes. We'll visit the spot Margaret meets her end a little later on in this trail. Whilst in the shambles and before we got sunk into the rest of the walk, we took a lunch stop at the Girton Henry's. You can find this little gem at the head of High Jubbergate at the junction of Newgate and Little Shambles. It is a beautiful Grade II listed building that was built as a townhouse in the 14th century. By the end of the 19th century, it had been divided up into different businesses and dwellings, and although surrounding properties have now been demolished, it remains as an important example of late medieval and post-medieval timber framing. It would have also been standing when Guy was growing up in the city. I wondered as we sat against the window and enjoyed our lunch, how often Guy might have passed it by, and whether he even came in himself. 
To date, it's a lovely restaurant with quaint views overlooking the Shambles Market. We stopped for a delicious bite to eat, and the menu had tasty but traditional offerings such as plowman's lunch, creamy pastas and flavoursome fish courses. And considering its spot in a tourist hotspot, it was also of a very reasonable price. I'd highly recommend this pit stop on the trip, if not for the location, but for the atmosphere and culinary enjoyment alone. After this refreshment, our trail continued onto the Ooze Bridge. During the childhood of Guy Fawkes, Ooze Bridge was crowded with buildings, one of which was the dreaded Kidcoats Prison. After the Act of 1572 ordered all Catholic priests to leave the country or be accused of treason, many were sent here. These priests and recusants, after losing all their possessions, were to wait in cramped conditions until their executions. It was here that Margaret Clitheroe awaited her trial for harbouring priests. Margaret was around 30 years old at the time and pregnant. Despite refusing to plead to the charge, she was found guilty and taken up to the toll booth here on Ooze Bridge. After being stripped and with a rock placed beneath her spine, Margaret was slowly crushed to death with a weight of around £800 under her own front door. Her death occurred within 15 minutes, but her body was left for six hours before the weight was removed. Today she is martyred a saint, and a relic, which is said to be her hand, is housed in the Bar Convent in York. This right hand, which was reputedly cut from her corpse by supporters after she'd been executed, is believed to have produced miracles. A plaque now marks the spot on Ooze Bridge that is thought to be where this tragedy befell Margaret. I can't f help but feel how sad it is that people would turn on each other like this for the sake of religion. I'm starting to see how these events happening in his home city might shape a young guy. Welcome to the Parish Church of All Saints Pavement, a fine medieval church situated in the heart of the city. Today when you step inside it offers a retreat of escapism from the bustling streets outside, an area of peace and calm, but it wouldn't be on our walking trail if it didn't have a grim past. On the wall inside this ancient church and above the vestry door, you will find replicas of the helmet, sword and gauntlets of Thomas Percy, 7th Earl of Northumbria. Remember from the beginning of our story, the Percy family is to become closely connected to Guy through his mother's new marriage. On the 22nd of August 1572, on the pavement outside this picturesque church, Thomas Percy was humiliated and beheaded without trial for leading the Catholic uprising of 1569. Just before his death, he made a speech, a public profession of faith, which apparently inspired Margaret Clitheroe to convert to Catholicism. Although Guy was just a young child when this terrible act happened, no doubt his mother and her peers felt the fear and horror of such a brutal execution on the city streets they called home. It's worth mentioning here that in 1605, alongside Guy, one of the conspirators in the gunpowder plot was another member of that same Percy family. From here we head to Micklegate Bar. Micklegate Bar is the most important of York's gateways and has acted as the focus for various important events, such as greeting a monarch on a royal visit. During Guy Fawkes' time, the greeting of King James I into the city would have been held here. This royal entrance was also used to display the severed heads of traitors, intended as a warning. It is here that the head of Thomas Percy, amongst other traitors, would have stood, skewered on pikes and displayed at the gate to be picked clean by magpies and crows. Although it's a gruesome and formidable entrance, there were people living over the bar as early as 1196, and the last resident left in 1918. From here there is the opportunity to climb the steps and begin to walk the city walls. The earliest surviving piece of the present gateway was built in the early 12th century, but there have been a gateway hereabouts since the Roman period. Roman stonework and even Roman coffins were reused by the medieval builders in its construction. If you come to visit the walls like us, you can scan the QR codes with your tablet or smartphone for the York City Walls Trail. A scheduled ancient monument, the York City Walls encircle the city. They are a free attraction that can be accessed on foot throughout the year. They were present during Guy Fawkes' time in York, so it's a great way to approach our next stop whilst also seeing the sights from a higher angle. We disembark the wall trail just before Lendl Bridge and head through the museum gardens towards St Mary's Abbey. 
At the start of our story, we covered how Henry VIII began to dissolve the monasteries. This is the spot that continues that thread. For inside the museum gardens in York stands the ruins of St Mary's Abbey, which for over 400 years was the wealthiest and most powerful abbey in the north of England and rivalled York Minster in splendour. In the year 1539, it was shut down by King Henry VIII and like all the other abbeys, priories and friaries, its buildings were sold off and stripped to fund Henry's war with Catholic France. Anger at the closure of the first convent led to the Pilgrimage of Grace in October 1536, when 35,000 rebel pilgrims entered York and demanded a return to the rule of the Pope and an elected parliament in York. Tricked to standing down by Henry VIII, the leader, Robert Askey, was executed. His body hung in chains for a month from York's Clifford Tower as a warning to Northern Catholics. When Guy Fawkes was growing up in York, the once sacred abbey had become a quarry for stone. I thought how sad to see such an important building fall to ruin. I wonder if Guy felt the same. On leaving the gardens, it is just a short walk round the corner to our second to last stop when we visit the King's Manor. The King's Manor. This was originally the house of the Abbot of St Mary's Abbey. It was built around 1270 and then substantially rebuilt in the late 15th century. After the Abbey was closed down, it became the headquarters of the Council of the North, which, among other things, were charged with weeding out Catholics and secret Popish priests. In 1541, Henry VIII himself stayed here, and this inspired its new name, the King's Manor. James VI of Scotland visited on his way south to become James I of England in 1603. You can see his initials by the front door at the foot of each column. Much hope was pinned on the new king being sympathetic to the Catholics, but it was not to be, and the Catholic versus Protestant struggle was to continue, despite his own wife being Catholic. A shield above the entrance is a symbol of unity, but what followed was almost 90 years of intermittent war because of this religious struggle. Remembered in folk memory by the rhyme, the lion and the unicorn were fighting for the crown, the lion beat the unicorn all about the town. And last on our list we visit St Peter's School. The school is still active, but the original spot is thought to be in Union Terrace Car Park, so we'll visit both just to be sure. The new site of the school is around a 10-minute walk from the King's Manor. In 1582, Guy attended St Peter's School along with John and Christopher Wright, who are to become two of the other gunpowder plotters. Oswald Tessimond was also a member of the school and of the plot, although he escaped to exile. St Peter's School is one of the oldest schools in the world, with a long and eventful history. Early historians have argued that St Peter's School has a continuous existence from the 7th century, but modern historians take a much more sceptical view. The original school is thought to have stood on the Union Terrace car park. Some of the buildings were badly damaged during the Siege of York in 1644 and the school removed to a site within the city walls. By coincidence, Guy Fawkes inherited from his father some land outside the city where the current school stands. In 1593, on his 21st birthday, he sold the land and used the money to leave home and enlist in the Spanish army, fighting for Catholics against Protestants in the religious wars raging across Europe. He became an expert in explosives and was described by his peers as brave and powerful. And so we return to the start of our story, which is also the end. For on the 20th of May 1604 and around 200 miles from York, the first meeting of the plotters is thought to have taken place at an inn just off the Strand in London. For a year they attempt to tunnel under the Houses of Parliament, but eventually Thomas Percy hires a cellar in which the gunpowder barrels were to be hidden. It was Guy Fawkes who was to remain in that cellar and light the fuse when the time came. While Guy was tortured, his fellow conspirators were hunted down. Guy Fawkes was the first to be found and the last to die. His sentencing was to be hung, drawn and quartered. Luckily, his neck was broken after he jumped or fell from the gallows ladder, and thus he evaded the full punishment, but his body parts were sent to the four corners of the kingdom as a warning to others. 
So that's the end of the video. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you get a different perspective of the plot now you've heard the background? What are your feelings towards Guy Fawkes? And do you think it's right that we still burn his effigy on the top of bonfires each November? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, guys. Please hit that like button so YouTube shares the video with other people like you. And get subscribing if you want to come on more wonderlisting adventures with us. Thank you.